A literary giant, central to the rebirth of the Southern narrative, William Faulkner earned a place in American literature as one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. In the emotional depth of his stories, his elaborate prose and meticulous vocabulary, and his use of multiple narrators, Faulkner exhibited an innovative style that placed him among the most influential novelists of his time and of ours. His funny and tragic tales of the mythic Yaknabatafa County made that place seem as real to his readers as any actual patch of red clay earth the true South could offer, and its imagined population became our strange southern aunts, uncles, and cousins. So I took on, and when I knew I had cash, I knew that living was terrible and that this was the answer to it. That was when I learned that words are no good, that words don't ever feed even what they're trying to say at. William Harrison Faulkner was born in New Albany, Mississippi on September 25, 1897. He grew up near Oxford, Mississippi, the eldest of four brothers in a traditional Southern family. Faulkner's native South was still healing from the Civil War just over 30 years before, a conquered and backward land in a progressively industrialized nation. The people of the South carried with them always a sense of tragedy that many of its writers, Faulkner perhaps more than most, would turn to their artistic advantage. It was a land with a profound sense of its own place in history and of the inexorable rush of time. When the shadow of the sash appeared on the curtains, it was between seven and eight o'clock. And then I was in time again here in the watch. It was grandfather's. And when father gave it to me, he said, I give you the mausoleum of all hope and desire. It's rather excruciatingly apt that you'll use it to gain the reducto absurdum of all human experience, which can fit your individual needs no better than it fitted his or his father's. I give it to you, not that you may remember time, but that you might forget it now and then for a moment, and not spend all your breath trying to conquer it. Because no battle is ever won, he said. They're not even fought. The field only reveals to man his own folly and despair. And victory is an illusion of philosophers and fools. In 1915, with World War I raging, Faulkner left his education behind. He never finished high school and went to work at his grandfather's bank. But he felt driven to aid in the war effort. Unable to qualify for the United States military due to his height, he headed north and signed on for pilot's training in the Canadian Air Force. Before his training was complete, the war had ended. He returned home frustrated and disappointed. Worse yet, he found that in his absence, the love of his young life had married someone else. He had a word, too. Love, he called it. But I had been used to words for a long time. I knew that that word was like the others, just a shape to fill a lack. That when the right time came, you wouldn't need a word for that, any more than for pride or fear. Cash did not need to say it to me, nor I to him. And I would say, let Ons use it if he wants to. So that it was Ons or love, love or Ons. It didn't matter. Back in Oxford, Faulkner enrolled in Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi, under a special provision for war veterans, but he dropped out after only three semesters. He took occasional jobs. He was a painter, then a postmaster. And when he wasn't working to put food on the table, he was a writer. During this time, he wrote the poems of The Marble Fawn, which he published in 1924. 
In 1925, he found work as a journalist in New Orleans, and it was there that he met Sherwood Anderson, an event that would significantly mark Faulkner's future. They became fast friends. Anderson, the more experienced writer, urged him to write about the people and places he knew best. When Faulkner completed his first novel, Soldier's Pay, it was Anderson who helped him find an editor. Published in 1926, the novel tells the story of a young man returning home from World War I, physically disabled, mentally devastated. The story tracks his deteriorating condition, his subsequent death, and its horrific effect on his family and friends. Two more novels followed, Mosquitoes and Flags in the Dust, but they were less assured works. After a trip to Europe, Faulkner settled again in his native south and began a series of stories set in the fictitious county of Yaknapatofa. The works that followed set amidst a hard scrabble landscape that Faulkner called his postage stamp of native soil depict a declining south, a society in decay amid war and racial conflict. The first novel of the series, Sartoris, was a reworking of Flags in the Dust and was published in 1929. The main character of John Sartoris led the third generation of a wealthy Southern family and was likely inspired by the author's great-grandfather, William Cuthbert Faulkner. Owner of the first railway line in Mississippi, the elder Faulkner had fought in the U.S. war against Mexico, was a colonel in the Confederate Army, and had himself authored a number of romantic novels before being killed defending his honor in a dispute with a former business partner. Sartoris was a sensational and brutal story, a story of rape, corruption, and disillusionment. But it was his next novel, The Sound and the Fury, that brought Faulkner the praise he deserved. Published just a few months later, The Sound and the Fury used, for the first time, the distinctive narrative technique which Faulkner pioneered, the interior monologue, or stream of consciousness. With The Sound and the Fury, Faulkner had matured as a writer. This work was at once fresh, raw, and grounded in the classical art of great storytelling. Once a bitch, always a bitch, what I say. I says you're lucky if her playing out of school is all that worries you. I says she ought to be down there in that kitchen right now, instead of up there in her room, gobbing paint on her face. 1929 was a significant year for William Faulkner, both professionally and personally. After publishing two novels, Sartoris and The Sound and the Fury, he married his childhood sweetheart, Estelle Oldham. She was recently divorced with two children he treated as his own. Not long after, in 1930, Faulkner acquired the lovely but run-down house he would name Rowan Oak, where he found sanctuary among his newly formed family and where he would spend several periods of inner exile. He and Estelle later would have a child together, a daughter named Alabama. Born prematurely, she died after only a few days. During this time, Faulkner worked days at a power plant while he wrote late into the night. As I Lay Dying was published in 1930. It tells the story of the Brundren family and the death of its matriarch, Addie. Addie has asked to be laid to rest a day's hard ride away to the north. And in transporting her body home, the surviving family face fire, flood, and unimaginable grief. The novel comes together through the diverse narrative voices and inner dialogues of some 15 distinct characters, including the dead Addie Brundren. I realized that I had been tricked by words older than aunts or love, and that the same word had tricked aunts too, and that my revenge would be that he would never know I was taking revenge. And when Darl was born, I asked Ons to promise to take me back to Jefferson when I died. Because I knew that Father had been right. Even when he couldn't have known he was right, any more than I could have known I was wrong. The 
The novel was well-reviewed, as were his two previous books, but it sold poorly. Faulkner demands a great deal of his readers. His complex phrases and multiple narrators sometimes seem to extend beyond the page, existing outside of time and narrative progression. His stories intertwine, one narrative interrupting another, then all giving way to interior monologue before returning to their tale. Before his work on As I Lay Dying, Faulkner had invested much effort in a novel he later said he'd conceived strictly to make money. The sordid story had been turned down for publication, but now, in light of his newfound success, it was reconsidered, and Sanctuary was published in 1931. The novel tells of the rape and kidnapping of an old Miss co-ed, Temple Drake, by a bootlegger named Popeye. Readers were horrified, shocked, and intrigued. Perhaps it was its sensationalism that attracted the attention of Hollywood. And, with his home heavily mortgaged, his wife and children wanting, Faulkner was in need of a more lucrative activity. In 1932, he left his small hometown of Oxford, following in the footsteps of Hemingway and Fitzgerald before him, to try his luck as a screenwriter. And he was quite a success. Faulkner worked with the noted director Howard Hawks, for whom he later produced one of his best and most famous screenplays for the film version of Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. Now he had another source of income, one that allowed him to continue writing excellent books that wouldn't sell. Faulkner wrote doggedly. As soon as he finished one book, he would begin a new one. In 1932, he published Light in August, considered one of his best novels. And in 1936 came another masterpiece, Absalom, Absalom. In it, Faulkner provides for the first time a geographical description and sketch of Yachtenbatafa County, his imaginary land that covers 2,400 square miles, inhabited by 6.928 white men and 9.313 colored. He would return again and again to Yachtenbatafa, and his diverse cast of native characters would reappear throughout his novels. In Absalom, Absalom, the reader once more meets Quentin Compson, who was first encountered in The Sound and the Fury. Compson describes the ruination of his family, and with the help of his Harvard roommate, recreates the obstinate efforts of Thomas Sutton to start a plantation and found a new dynasty. The saga of violence and pride, incest and crime, ends in failure, amidst a society in decline and a people scarred by racism and bigotry. Race, of course, was another subject that would serve Faulkner well throughout his writing career. I think that in time, the Jim Bonds are going to conquer the Western Hemisphere. Of course, it won't be quite in our time. And, of course, as they spread towards the poles, they'll, they'll bleach out again like the rabbits and the birds do, so they won't show up so sharp against the snow. But it'll still be Jim Bond. And so in a few thousand years, I who regard you will also have sprung from the loins of African kings. The Unvanquished appeared in 1938, a series of seven novellas, six of which had appeared previously in the Saturday Evening Post. Faulkner spent much of 1941 writing and reworking stories of the McCaslin family into the episodic novel Go Down Moses, published in 1942. And Faulkner wrote on The Wild Palms, The Hamlet, Intruder in the Dust, Night's Gambit. It is not that I can live. It is that I want to. It is that I want to. The old flesh in the end, no matter how old. For if memory were to exist outside of the flesh, it wouldn't be memory, for it wouldn't know what it remembers. So when it ceased to exist, so did half the memory. And if I ceased to exist, all memory would too. Yes, he thought. Between sorrow and nothingness, I choose sorrow. 
Faulkner's enigmatic style makes him a difficult author for some. He interrupts one story to tell another parallel story, or to describe a landscape in captivating detail. He plunges the reader deep into the subconscious of his characters, in digressive passages of interior monologue that close in on an event through changing narrators and multiple points of view. Difficult indeed. By 1944, taste had begun to change. Most of Faulkner's works were either out of print or simply unread by American audiences. But in that year, Faulkner began a correspondence with the noted critic Malcolm Cowley. And in 1946, Cowley brought together the portable Faulkner, a chronological collection of excerpts from his novels that gave the Yoknabatafa saga a fresh clarity and made Faulkner's work newly accessible to a new generation of readers. It was the portable Faulkner and publication of his collected stories in 1950 that finally brought the writer to international prominence. On November 10, 1950, William Faulkner was recognized for his brilliant and challenging work. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, but his work was not done. Since the end of World War II, Faulkner had been working on the book he intended to be his greatest. In 1954, he published A Fable. Unlike most of his previous work set in the American South, A Fable tells a story set in the Europe of World War I and based on actual events of April 17, 1917. The novel illustrates the horrors of war, weaving a complex story told through multiple interpretations that flow backward and forward in time. It is perhaps one of the greatest anti-war novels ever written, earning Faulkner both a National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Yesterday, at the break of dawn, a French regiment has done something, done something or not done something, that a first unit should or shouldn't do. And as a result, military operations in Western Europe have been interrupted yesterday at three in the afternoon. A fable, as the title suggests, is both educational and moralizing interweaving stories and characters faced with the inexorable presence of death, showing us their contradictions, their hopes, their miseries, their courage, and their cowardice. But in time, you get old and you can see death. And then you realize that there's nothing, not power or glory or wealth or pleasure, not even freedom from suffering that has as much value as the simple act of breathing. Simply being alive, even with the burden of memory and the grief of the hopelessly weary body. Simply to know that you are alive. In 1951, Faulkner published his only play, Requiem for a Nun a continuation of the story of Temple Drake that he had first told in Sanctuary. Like so much of his narrative fiction, the play is a work of technical bravura. The introduction alone, in Faulkner's usual narrative style, is several pages long. Three narrative prose sections precede each of the play's acts. Translated into French and staged by Albert Camus, Requiem for a Nun was a great theatrical success. For the last ten years of his life, much of the brilliant author's time was taken up with his love of women and alcohol. He was in and out of Wright Sanitarium in Bahalia, where he was treated numerous times for alcoholism. Though his addiction was of a strange sort, he would often plan both the start and the end of his binges, and he found the time and energy to continue his work, turning out complex and many-layered stories, the multiplicity of voices inhabiting his own vivid, novelistic universe. He finished the trilogy of The Hamlet with The Town in 1957 and The Mansion in 1959. I don't remember just when it was, I was probably pretty young, when I realized that 
I'd come from what you might call a, a family, a clan, a, a race, maybe even a species a pure sons of bitches. So I said, okay, okay, if that's the way it is, we'll just show them. They call the best of lawyers, lawyers' lawyers. And the best of actors, uh, an actor's actor. And the best of athletes, a ball player's ball player. All right, that's what we'll do. Every Snopes will make it his private and personal aim to have the whole world recognize him as the son of a bitch's son of a bitch. The Reavers, published in 1962, was his last published novel and his most humorous. The story's brisk narrative brings us the light-hearted tale of Boone Hagenbeck, who takes 11-year-old Lucius Loosh Priest and the family's black coachman on a joyride to a Memphis brothel in Lucia's grandfather's car. Its characters were, in a word, unforgettable. Published in 1962, it won Faulkner his second Pulitzer Prize for fiction, posthumously, for Nobel Laureate, Pulitzer Prize winner, William Faulkner, died of a heart attack on July 6, 1962. I can remember how when I was young, I believed death to be a phenomenon of the body. Now I know it to be merely a function of the mind and that of the minds who suffer the bereavement. The nihilists say it is the end. The fundamentalists, the beginning. When in reality, it's no more than a single tenant or family moving out of a tenement or a town. Faulkner left us more than 20 novels in which he portrays the dramatic conflict between the Old South and the New. To create them, he transcended literary boundaries with his use of innovative narrative techniques, interior monologue, multiple voices, and narrative time shifts. A true master of his craft, William Faulkner stands today among the giants of American literature. I could just remember how my father used to say that the reason for living was to get ready to stay dead a long time.